Welcome everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast, where I look to distill the best practices and best ideas of the world's most successful families and their family offices. I hope to provide thought-provoking opinions and feature amazing thought leaders to the listeners of our podcast with an eye towards the future of the family office. Today's podcast is titled Resilience of 100-Year Family Enterprises, How Opportunistic Innovation, Business Discipline, and a Culture of Stewardship Guide the Journey Across Generations. Now, that's way too awesome and intellectual of a title for me to think of. This is really the amazing work and really lifelong of our very special guest, I'm gonna say the return, because I think it's been about two years, the return of Dr. Dennis Jaffe, author, family office enterprise, and family office thought leader extraordinaire. Dennis, it's so great to have you back. Well, thank you, Angelo. I've, I've been on um, you know, so many um, of your uh, you know, podcasts and meetings, and it's just a pleasure to, uh, to be with you. Wow, I got to pay you more money, Dennis. You're so sure. kind. Sure. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's great to see your face. For those of you that are wondering who would hear this on a podcast, we're recording it as a Zoom video as well. Uh, unless Dennis is elsewhere, he's all the way in the Bay Area. Uh, so as many of you know, we're in the midst of COVID-19, so challenging times. And I thought that to have Dennis on, given his book, and his years and years of research, let alone decades of work in this community, but his multiple years of research into what makes a family enterprise, a family itself sustain, not for one, two, or even three generations, but we're talking his exhaustive research on a hundred year plus families and their enterprises. So I'm really excited. Dennis, why don't I jump right into it? This right. has been a very long and probably a very passionate journey for you. Out of love and joy, I know you and how you immerse yourself in something like this. How do you go about identifying all these amazing global 100-year-old plus families? And I mean, you must have traveled the world. It's not just phone call and Zooms. You know, pre-COVID, this was face-to-face -face with people. How exciting. Well, this was this was a, a labor uh, a labor of love. Um, so I've always, um, since actually the field began, when people started to say, you know, we really should study and, and learn about family businesses. They seem to be different, and um, maybe there's something that we can learn from them. So that's how the field started. And um, about seven years ago, I made a very very good career move, which is I retired. <laughs> and. I had no more day job and nothing that I had to do. So I was like, what am I going to do? And, and one of the things that I had always wanted to do, I had two big questions. One is I worked mostly in the U.S. and a lot of the fields started in the U.S. And all these um, things that people recommend uh, uh, that families should do, I was wondering whether is this just U.S. kind of advice or is this something that, that applies to global families. Some of them have been around for hundreds of years. So that was one question. And, um, uh, and, and the other question, um, you know, what was, um, you know, are the things that people are prescribing, are they real? Do they really work? Are they really useful? So professionals say, well, you should create a family council and a board and have a constitution and have family meetings and, and all these things sound well, of course you should do that, but the question is, are they are families really doing that? And I noticed in the literature, there really wasn't anything um, about that. So a lot of us have, have, have read, um, you know, books like, like um, you know, Built to Last, and before that, the, um, the, the Excellence books by Peters and Waterman, and, and they were based on the sure. idea that um, uh, actually comes from a psychologist, uh, Abe, Abe Maslow, who said, well, you you're never going to learn about anything about healthy people by studying mentally ill. And, and if you study um, families that are, that, are, that are just okay, 
or families that are falling apart. Um, you're never, you, you're going to learn a lot about why they fall apart, but that's not going to tell you enough to, be, how to, 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 to let you know how to be excellent. So following built to last and things like that, I said, let me look at and discover what are excellent companies. So I decided that, that what I would look at is families that have been successful over many generations. So I said, let's get families that are beyond the third generation, because that's maybe, you know, it's hard to define how, how many there are, but let's say 1% of family businesses. And ones that have been successful in creating value across generations. And um, so the, the average size of these families were close to a billion dollars a year in, in uh, a, a billion dollars net worth. Um, and, uh, um, and the families, um, they were families. And um, so the other thing is that they had been successful at maintaining their family identity and their family partnership over these generations. So you asked, how did I locate them? Well, the short answer is friends. Um, I started out um, in, in, in um, partnership with Family Office Exchange, um, which, you know, and- uh, I never heard uh, of them. Yeah, I heard of them. <laughs> you know, no, they're, you know, it's another, another firm, you know, another uh, <laughs> network, but, um, and uh, the Family Business Network, and they both offered me access to families. So I decided um, instead of doing a survey um, where you get all these answers, but you don't really know what they're talking about, I wanted to talk to them. So I, I, I wanted to meet with these families and talk to members of at least of two different generations, an older and a younger generation. And I wanted to hear their stories. I wanted to get stories, not just ticks on a, on a, on a questionnaire. And um, the idea was if they had been around for three generations, they could look back and they say, you know, one thing that we did in our second generation that was really important is this. Um, and so they, they, I had the opportunity to look back and to have them say, this is important. This really made a difference for us and to look at the things that they were doing. So most families are not 100 year families, but I think they can learn from uh, these 100 year families what to do in the first, second generation to set themselves up so that they can uh, reach this wonderful goal. Well, I mean, one question I'm simply going to have for you. I'm a first-generation business. I have a teenage son going off to college in ooh, 13, 14 more months. Yeah. Uh, how does a creator of a business that has a next generation get them to be interested and involved, what were some of the common traits? And then to go from the second to the third generation, then often the third to the fourth. How do they do this? Well, there was a, a lot of things. So, so there was one theme that, that came out across, again, that, that I, a lot of the themes that came out, on the one hand, they're obvious. On the other hand, I was really surprised. So here is a theme that surprised me, is that these families, first of all, they pointed out to me that in the first generation with a single wealth creator like you, you're not a family business. You have an intention to create a family business, but you have not done it yet. And what I also learned is that the wealth creators were probably not temperamentally suited to be um, creators of a family business, that it needed a different set of skills. They had to be less secretive, less controlling, more collaborative, more open, more transparent, all qualities. All things I don't do, Dennis. They're, these are not common <laughs> in entrepreneurs. So here's the learning. The learning is, is that, the that these families made two decisions. One, the wealth creator made a decision or, or, or created a wonderful business. That was the first um, success factor. The second success factor is that somebody in the second, sometimes the third generation, said, we're going to create a, 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 a great family um, that is the foundation of a family business. So they created a family. And what they focused on is building a great family is, a, is not about financial return. It's about non-financial values. Creating a great family is about valuing people. It's about valuing the future and looking ahead to the future and, and, and saying, how are we creating a um, uh, future together. It's about, um, it's about building and, and reinventing yourself. So all of these things are about um, creating 
family relationships. And, uh, and that was the task of the second, third generation to take the wonderful business that the creator had. And, um, uh, and, 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 and the other theme that, I, that, that was very appropriate, so um, is that, that these businesses are, are always reinventing themselves. Half of the families had sold their legacy family business. And this is where family offices come up, that, that when they yes. sell the business or when they take a lot of capital, they have a very profitable business, a lot of capital comes out, then family business is a result of uh, family office is a result of a second a successful family business. So they created family offices. They, they, they bought new businesses. They trained and, and encouraged the next generation to find new ideas and to be innovators. And they did a lot um, to reinvent themselves. So one of the funny things that happened is, so this book came out, my book came out a month before the COVID thing. So I had a whole global world tour plan. I was gonna to go to every continent. I was gonna give talks in India and Asia and Australia, South America. It was gonna have the most wonderful year um, traveling the world because um, I could do it. And all of a sudden I came back one day and bang, everything was, was canceled. And I started to say, well, gee, is my book even relevant? I mean, who cares when people are trying to survive? Who cares about 100 year families? I just wanna be, a next year family. That, 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 that's, the, that's the only thing I think of. But, but what, I, what I found is that the families that were uh, in my book were, were writing and, and telling me stories about resilience. And that's what we're all about right now. Um, some, uh, it was a wonderful article um, in the New York Times a couple of days ago about how um, the, the virus is kind of an accelerator. And in things that we thought would happen in 10 or 15 years, are now happening this year. So um, in, the, in the article, it says this is like 2032 all of a sudden, um, uh, you know, where uh, all changes. So the ideas of resilience and reinvention are being tested in families as they, um, as they plan their recovery and plan, well, what, do we want to be together? What are we doing together? Um, there's there's uh, all kinds of things that families have to look at um, as a result of the pandemic and the global crisis and the, uh, all the things that are happening now that they probably, they, they, they might have been able to get away with not looking at for several years, but they were all there. Structural weaknesses, uh, um, you know, things that people had to do. If you had to drill down to among the most common trait that you saw in these families that had businesses that sustained generation after generation? Is it vulnerability, authenticity? Is it having a structure for making decisions? Is it none of that? What is it? What's the it, one secret it, ingredient? It's a number of things. There isn't, I mean, anybody that's in business, a business is complex enough. A business formed by a family, that is the most complex thing that, that human beings could ever create. So to think that there's one thing that you do and that makes it all happen. And uh, by, by background, I'm a management um, uh, 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 scientist and a sociologist. So I'm not interested in the, I, I'm interested in the internal attitudes that people have like authenticity and uh, integrity and things like that, but I'm interested in what they do. And there was a, a couple of themes that came out loud and clear in these hundred families. And, and first of all, let me say, is very, very, uh, when you think about it, so I, I interviewed 100, 100 year families, every continent, um, 20 different countries, all kind, every, every industry um, you know, uh, that you could imagine, um, all kinds of sizes, all kinds of uh, different structures. The, just the very fact that I came up with some common themes is like pretty, Unex you know, pretty unusual. And not only did I come up with common themes, but I came up with very, very loud, consensual common themes. And so here are some of them. One is the overwhelmingly most common thing that they cited was having a clear set of values that they reinforced and reaffirmed for every generation. So they had a value. They, they had a commitment to something, a 
something that they stood for, a culture that reinforced it. They had values and they, they really considered this important. This is who we are in the deepest sense. But the values on their own, they said, they, values don't do anything. Values, you got the values up on your, your wall. That's great. What does it do? Nothing. So with the values, the, 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 the families had to come up with a governance structure and policies and processes to put these values into action. They had to actually create the family culture. So, and, and, and one, of the, um, one of the things that they all emphasized is that they, they, it wasn't just about how do we run the business? Because for most of them, there wasn't a business, there was a bunch of businesses. And by the way, they had a foundation. And uh, by the way, they had um, not one family, but, but many, many households and they lived all over the place. And there was like 200 family members and, and 80 households. And all those people had shares of different businesses. So they had to create a family organization to, um, to kind of organize the non-business things that the family did and a business organization and a board and a, you know, kind of a, you know, operating uh, principles and policies and things like that. And often they had to do a uh, foundation um, governance. So they had to organize. That's the second thing. They had to become a complex organization with a lot of different entities and a lot of different agreements. And they had, the more people there were, the more they had to organize. Then there were four paths, and I'll just mention them very briefly, but these were things that the families did in order to make it real. And one is they had a tremendous amount of cross-generational engagement. And this gets back to your original question, Angelo, where <laughs> you said, how do I get my kids um, well, you don't hand them a piece of paper and say, here are the values I want you to do in your life. What you, and you don't wait till they're 25 and they're, they're off and finished college and doing their life. You start when they're young and you, you live and you uh, engage them in discussions and in activities together. And these families had very, very, very high cross-generational engagement. Um, not just one way, not just okay, we're gonna be engaged, I'm the elder, I'm gonna tell you what to do. That's not engagement, that's, that's dictatorship. Engagement is, here's what I'd like and here's what really matters to me. Let's talk about you and, and what you wanna do and, and how you see these things. And let's work together so that what I consider important, because I'm old and you're young, um, and, you know, and, and how you might carry them out. And uh, this is true in family, this is true in the business, this is true in philanthropy. So there's engagement. Um, the, 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 the second thing is, is that these families, the second path is that these families all have a social commitment. They're looking beyond the family. It isn't just me um, and, and, and only me, our family and only us. It's really something that they see as in order for them to have something to give to their grandchildren, which is what family business is about, there has to be a world and there have to be employees and there has to be, um, uh, you know, they have to create a wonderful uh, community. And so there's a social commitment. The, the third thing, and this is, um, uh, you know, what again comes back to the next generation, is they prepare and they develop and they excite and they um, invite the next generation to be involved. They're active, they have programs, they do things for the next generation. The next generation, one family member said, that is our product. Our product as a family is the next generation. And if we create a crappy product, we're gonna have a crappy outcome and everybody's gonna be mad at us. And if we create a wonderful product, the next generation will, whatever they do, will make us proud. So next generation um, development and, um, and, uh, and, and mentoring. And, and the final one, which is implicit is they're, <clears throat> they're they're always questioning what they're doing. They're, they're, they're doing their business, they're, they're, um, they're creating um, a wonderful profit, but they're always looking ahead at new opportunities and new sources of value. And so they actually um, uh, challenge and, and, and ask the next generation, um, come up with new ideas, help us um, innovate, use 
the education that we paid for, the big education we paid for and the travel that we've invested in and all the things that we've done and all of the digital um, hours you spent online and bring all those ideas to help the family because we, the older elders, we don't know what to do. So you're the one who's got the, you know, got your ear to, to the sidewalk. You tell us what to do. So, so this is the way, the, the, the kind of the, the, the way in which generative, the, I call them value creating families work. They're engaged across the next generation. They're developing, they have social commitment, they have structures, they're tremendously complex attitudes. I don't think any one thing is the special sauce. I think they're, all of these things are, are, are important. That was amazing insight, Dennis. Some questions I have from that, and admittingly cheated a little bit. I believe I read you quote this one word that kind of helps make everything kind of work out. And I'm going to relate a little bit to a year ago, I had a divorce attorney on that was like a leading authority in the Northeast. And he goes, Angelo, when there's contempt with a husband and wife, there's probably nothing that any therapist or anyone could do. And one of the things that leads to that, besides not being a good listener, being empathetic, et cetera, is a lack of communication. So would you say that simply one word, even when you disagree with the elder, the millennial, whatever it might be, if you're able to keep respectful communication open, consistent, and to some degree, maybe with a professional to facilitate it, you're gonna go down a good path it's going to be a huge benefit. Well, let me let me let me um, amplify that a little bit because people <clears throat> quote that there's this this you know kind of a spurious statistic that eighty percent of the family businesses fail because they don't have communication, and it's like what are they talking about? So I've talked to a lot of elders, um, and uh, when they talk about we don't have communication in their family, I say, well, tell me what what's not happening, and. Their idea is that communication is, I say something and they do it. And <laughs> since they're not doing it, we're not communicating. And, um, and uh, the, the, the fact is that communication, as you were starting to say, is a lot more than that. It involves being able to listen. And then when you listen and you feel that your ideas are not the only ideas, then you have to let go. And, and sometimes, horror of horrors, you have to let people do something that, that you don't really know about and that you're not really comfortable with. Oh my gosh, what, that's scary. And this is something that elders, since they have the power, they're, they're reluctant to do. And yet the successful families say to the next generation, well, your job is to think of new ideas. There, there was one family, here's a, this is a family that is in one of the wealthiest families in the world and no one has ever heard of it. And this family, is in, has biz, large businesses in about 30 different countries. <laughs> and they innovate, they have a council of family members and um, that, that runs it. Um, but they, they, they have rules like um, no more than five family members can live in any one country. <laughs> so if there's more than Never five, heard if you're starting out, you have to go and, and the next thing is they expect all young people, first they serve an apprenticeship, in one of the family businesses and they learn, they get their education. Then they're expected, it's kind of like you're supposed to go out and start a new business. And so this family now owns about 200 businesses. And yeah, most of them aren't profitable, but 20, 25% of them are super profitable. And so they own maybe eight or $9 billion businesses all over the world. Wow. And nobody knows that this family owns all this stuff. Um, so communication, getting back, communication is, it's too easy a word without defining it, it further. And, and that's why when I, when you talk about communication, I mean, cross-generational engagement and collaboration is the way I see it rather than as just, um, sending messages back and forth, um, uh, and, and, and hearing the message because you can hear and times and not do anything about it. And that's not very effective. Among the four things you mentioned sequentially, I'd like to kind of cover two of them in kind of one clip. They were the first two, values and organization, some level of structure. Right. So 
for someone like me, that's going to sound broadly like governance, how we mutually as a family make decisions. Right. I mean, you've written about, I've written about in my books, uh, the easiest way, for sure. The easiest way is what Warren Buffett said about investment committees. I like an odd number investment committee that's under three. It's just one person. It's a dictatorship. It's the most easy. It's convenient. And for any entrepreneur that's a wealth creator, it probably is 90% of them that's kind of all they know. Warren Buffett, as benevolent and as, as uh, Santa Clausy as he is, is a, is a very traditional um, wealth creating first generation person. And he, he, he's the smartest person in the room. He will listen to reports from other people, but he's not gonna delegate responsibility. He's uh, making all the decisions. That is paternalism. Um, and that is the model of the first generation. Now, let's say Warren Buffett has like three or four children, and, you know, um, and they each have, you know, foundations and, and they're doing, but, but it's like when you look in two or three generations down, um, you have 60, 30, maybe family members, marriages, kids, you have blended families, you have ex-spouses, you have all these different things. And, um, you know, they're, they're, um, you can't have um, that committee of three with uh, one person having three four votes. Um, it doesn't work. And so the families talk about how one of the big events in creating a family business is to move from the paternalistic, uh, my way or the highway, I'm the smartest person, I know what I'm doing, and you don't, um, and I'm in control. And uh, the best thing that you can do uh, with your life is to listen to me and shut up. And uh, to creating a collaborative environment, a collaborative um, community with roles and responsibilities, and that's governance. And so Warren Buffett doesn't need governance. I'm sure if you talk to Warren Buffett about family governance, he'd say, well, that's nice. I, we have governance. I do what I do it and everybody else, follow, you know, and everybody else does it, follows me. That's not gov that governance doesn't work um, in the second or third generation. Even if a person is appointed as the family leader, um, one, one family I talked to, um, there were four daughters followed by a son. And the four daughters, this was a very, you know, kind of a male dominated uh, traditional society. And so the father in his wisdom decided that he was gonna pass leadership to his son, who was the youngest of five. And the four older daughters, uh, you know, they were professionals, they were, um, they were philanthropists, they were, they were well-educated, they were leaders in the community and even in politics. They were tremendous and they were big personalities. And so the father said, well, you're the boss. And he said, and the son said, well, I wanna have a council um, you know, with my sisters and, and they're perfectly comfortable with me being the leader, but we should have a, a council and, and, you know, and talk about ideas and, and decisions. And the father said, no. You, you, you're, that's you, that, that's you're not you won't have authority that way, and for the for the for the second generation, I can't have authority if I don't listen to my sisters. That would be ridiculous. It's you know, unthinkable. So the father in this case have to say was 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 not correct, and the son just you know basically started creating a council. He may not have he may have forgotten to mention it to his father or whatever, but he had it. And, um, and that was the family governance, is the council helped oversee, helped talk about acquisitions. There was a lot of things that the family did. And, and by creating a council, that was, that was governance. And that was something that the father had no idea um, uh, of why he would want to do this. And he have actually felt it was bad leadership by the son. And in that example of a good number, by the way, happens to be with a for uh, sisters and him, a total of five. What have you seen be most successful in families that last beyond the third generation? If it's an odd number like three or five, do they look to reach consensus? Do they need to have majority? And inevitably, does one person kind of have to steward or steer the ship to some extent? There are all kinds of, all kinds of models. I mean, I, I think the 
there has to be a, a way of making decisions. So if you have consensus, and a lot of families say we're going to have consensus, you still need a, 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 a plan if there isn't consensus. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, wrote, I wrote a column a couple of years ago that was very, very um, you know, well received and, and sent around. And it was about how, how the stupidest decision you could ever make in a, is, is to create a 50-50 uh, a ownership structure with your kids. Um, you know, you can't think of anything more stupid because it, they're going to inevitably get into a fight and who breaks the tie? Argue about how to, you know, who's the deciding vote, and um, and it's going to be a be a problem. Um, and so you've got to have a decision making. That's what governance is. When you created a governance agreement, you say, "What happens if we disagree? What happens if I want to sell the business? What happens if I am pissed off at what you're doing and you're making the decision, and I want to leave the business?" Um, all of those things have to be spelled out because any families can argue about anything. And even when they spell out, you know, and write a 30 page constitution, they still will find something to fight about and argue about. Um, and, uh, uh, but some families have a deep desire and, and respect for each other that enables them to make decisions and others, um, they, they have respect and care until they don't. There's a couple of elements to governance, and you already briefly mentioned a couple of them. I'm going to rank them in my order, okay. but I'm starting to think my order should be a little different. Values, mission, followed by vision. I'm beginning to think I'm underestimating vision, and maybe the vision should be towards the top. Why am I wrong? Well, I mean, I, it, it, these, are all, they, these are all lumped together. I mean, we used to argue about... What, what's the vision and what's the mission and what's the purpose statement and things like that. And basically there's the general principles that make up the culture that the family has to agree on. Um, and then, um, and, and the mission is the purpose. A vision is, is, a, is kind of a squirrely thing um, because it, it, some people think of the vision as a picture of what you want to become. Um, but I think sometimes um, the vision doesn't take into account unexpected and doesn't take into account somebody may come along with an entirely new idea. So um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what to do um, with vision. I talk about purpose and values um, and, and I, I, I've been talking, the vision is um, what you're all creating together. That's um, I, I almost like it's a little bit further down the line after you have your purpose and you know it's like what are we doing together and then you begin to say, well, what, what do we want to create with this? What, what's the future? What do we want to see for our grandchildren? I mean, families How does talk it? About, families talk about seven generation <laughs> families. My mm -hmm. wonderful friend, Jay Hughes, and there are companies named seventh generation. And um, I don't know, what are you, what are you going to say? Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're creating for seven generations from now, other than God, I hope to God we still have a world and, um, that we can live in um, without being masked and living underground in caves and things like that. I, you know, it, it, vision is a hard thing. You also mentioned earlier, many families will exit perhaps forcefully or, or probably more just the lack of further passion and purpose and a good opportunity to exit. And they'll segue into philanthropy and their single family office, which in many ways, like you said, replaces the the bond and the tribe nature that they had in a more classic family business. My experience though, with some disappointment I might add, Dennis, is that when families go from a successful multi-generational business, maybe it's just me looking at the wrong families, many of them don't hold their philanthropy or their family office to the same level of passion, of discipline, of rigor that they did their classic family business? Well, I mean, in a way, I mean, sure, because it's like when everybody lives in the same town and they have a business and the business is right there in the center of town and everybody, you say, I'm a so-and-so and everybody said, oh, are you that so-and-so? Oh, yes, we are. Um, it, it's a, your identity, is really much much more grounded than um, when you sell the business. That's the identity. So 
then the family members have to look at each other and say, well, do I want to be your partner for the rest of my life? Um, would I rather have my own little empire um, uh, or do I want to be part of a larger empire? Do we agree on what we want to create? So there's a choice point. And the same with, with moving. Um, when people move all over the world um, and the business may be in, in one town and, um, you know, sometimes uh, it just doesn't, have the energy. So the families in, in my study spend a lot of time building family identity. If they have a family office, uh, if they've moved all over the place, if they have 200 family members, they really have to invest, invest money, resource to create a, a family identity. They have to have annual meetings, um, you know, and, and not just a, a two hour business meeting, but really get together. They have to have fun together. They uh, sometimes uh, uh, maintain a family home, a wonderful family home in some place where, where um, you know, people can, can get together. Um, they, there's a lot of way, things that you have to do to keep a culture alive when you don't, when everybody isn't together and, um, uh, and, and, and you don't have the, the business. So every, all these things weaken the family. And these 100-year families that stay together, they, f they counteract the weakness by creating structures. So um, some family offices have created a wonderful family structure. They have a summer program or a ranch or a gathering or a foundation um, or something that excites the next generation to want to come. Because if you have an annual family meeting, you're going to find that the, the next generation, the youngest generation, are going to say, well, I got to, I got to do this. I got to go to, you know, I've got, you know, a, a job. I can't get time off. I've got young kids. Um, I got to go to my wife's family. I, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why you're not going to come to the annual meeting. And families that are successful, they just make the annual meeting so much fun and um, that, that people want to come to it. So they have like, a lot of the families have family camps. And so the young people want to go to family camp because they love their cousins. <laughs> and so the younger generation says, we got to go because I, how, I, how I'm going to see cousin Emmy and, you know, and, and, and all these people and they, 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 they want to see me. I got it. And so the younger gener younger kids make the family, make the time to come. And, uh, and the families often do it by one mechanism is they pay for it. They say we will pay your expenses and um, and uh, everything that's here, and, and they make it um, attractive. So, you you this is where the investment um, is really important because you don't just have a hundred year family; you have to create it and and continually create. Let's continue with my dream of my son, Dennis, but a little yeah. different perspective. Let's just assume my son inherits or takes over and of course will do a better job than me my business he then has a daughter who then so now i'm looking at third generation how do i make her in my example not look at me as does some older guy who likes to wear seersucker suits which i do uh and let's say that i pass on don't we all how do i maintain my entrepreneurship my history of the family, how is that legacy preserved? Now, before you answer, I will add, uh, we have Lori Rue on the line or on the Zoom call as well. So uh, 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 taking that history via video uh, and via formatting that could last forever is one way, but I'll allow you to elaborate. Well, that's one, one way. The, the, the story is, is important. Um, there, one thing that, that happens in, in families um, by the third generation, most of the families that still have the family business move towards having a non-family CEO because the family is interested in governance, they're interested in the foundation, they're interested in things like uh, the future of the earth and social responsibility, but um, a, a lot of times they're not interested in, in uh, in the business itself. So family members have non-family executives to be the uh, business leaders. But then um, the family um, creates 
something, say, like a family bank, where family members can invest in new ideas, where they, the entrepreneurship is not, um, is, you can't be very entrepreneurial in a third generation business that, you know, does something and, and you know, has, you know, is not, uh, not the most innovative business. You could create innovation by having family members create new businesses and new ideas. Um, so um, you, 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 you can't guarantee it, um, but you've got to, you know, you've just got to, um, you know, create ways for people in, in your younger generation to do, do what they're passionate about. You can't make them passionate about what you're passionate about. Your work as a sociologist, uh, as a deep researcher, and also following up on the before mentioned work of Jay Hughes, uh, Matt Wesley, and other thought leaders like yourself that are legendary in this community, I'm going to go back to something that you you did use the word, I used it, but I don't think we dove enough, enough into it, uh, tribes. What is deemed to be tribal? And is that a theme you've seen successfully in families? They're able to have the glue that holds it together. Well, that's what, that's what I call these families, tribes, because um, I, I started out by saying, well, tell me about your family. And um, in the interview, they, they kind of scratch their heads and say, what do you mean? I say, what do you mean? Family, everybody knows what, and they say, no, 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 no. There's my nuclear family, my household, my wife, my kids, um, you know, and, and then there's the, the wider family. And I started, so I stopped, I started saying, well, the, 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 your immediate family is a household. And then what's the larger family, the extended family? And as a, a in studying sociology, anthropology, that's a tribe. It's a group, uh, it's, a, it's a group of households that share a common heritage. And when you look at a tribe, they, they go back generations to a founder, um, they, uh, they revere that founder, they, um, uh, they're, they're living um, in a culture and, a, and, a, and an environment that was created um, and started by that founder, but there are rules to being a part of the tribe. There are tribal meetings, there's a tribal council. Starts to look a lot like a, uh, you know, like a, um, a family governance to me. And, and so I, I say we're moving from a household to a tribe and that that's what these extended families are. You mentioned things to, that the elders could encourage the next generation, uh, kind of your big four, the values, the organization, uh, the mentoring, the questioning and being open-minded, having a beginner's mindset. What would be what, although if you're interviewing successful families, it's the reverse of that. What are some things absolutely not to do besides the obvious answer of don't do the opposite of those four things I said? Is it being domineering and not listening? What are our like major no-nos that are usually going to result in disaster? Well, there, there, I mean, one of the things that I say in the book and that, that a lot of people have seized on is I say the worst advice that the, that the uh, wealth creator can give his kids is never sell the family business. <laughs> and if you generalize and you say that, that the more you set rigid guidelines, say don't sell the family business, um, only family members, um, uh, family members have to work in the business to inherit. The more you set rigid rules, the more you set things up for people to either leave um, or rebel. Um, uh, so I think being rigid about the future rather than being open to the future um, is, is definitely um, uh, a danger sign. Um, I think that, that um, you know, that, that, that following the, the ethic of um, let, let's, uh, let's look for better return from our business, let's, uh, let's um, you know, ramp it up and expand it and, and make more and more money is, is another problem. Not that these families don't make a lot of money, but um, I, I didn't get exact statistics, but my guess is that these families routinely uh, plow three quarters of their income back into the business uh, or into their family office and investments. So they, 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 uh, one of the ways that they, that they create wealth over the generations 
is they, they take out very little wealth and yet they live very nicely. Um, but they, they don't, um, they don't um, you know, they don't over consume. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think uh, having a, um, a culture in the family where, where people are um, extravagant and spending a lot of the profits uh, and not reinvesting um, is, a, is another um, a danger sign. With some of your experiences in psychology, uh, that the classic person would be trained on things like executive function, emotional intelligence, potentially grit and resilience. Are those things that could be taught and enhanced? Are they inherent? And are they absolutely necessary to be successful? Well, again, most, most qualities are, there's an inherent talent. And uh, so if you're not musically inclined, you probably can learn how to play the piano. Um, you're never gonna you know, have people lining up to hear you, but you can be entertaining and entertain yourself. Um, uh, and, and I think that's the way the, these things are. Family members can, can teach each other um, uh, skills of collaboration. And one of the concepts that, that I came up with in the book, which I think is one that people don't think about, which is family members, um, in order to be responsible stewards in the next generation, they have to become kind of family enterprise professionals. So they have to know about governance. They have to have some executive skills. They have to understand what a board is and what the role of a board is. They have to um, understand the, the different roles and authorities that family members have. They have to um, know how to listen and compromise and, um, uh, and be respectful of each other. So these are skills that, you know, even though some people are better at them, everybody can learn them and a family can um, create a culture where certain behaviors are expected and certain you know, people are expected to develop the skills. You're expected to know how to come to a meeting and read um, the financial results and uh, know when to talk and when to be quiet and, um, and, and what this board is doing and what they're not doing. So I think professional family members have to become professional family members uh, in the third or fourth generation, which is, you know, what we mean by responsible stewardship. And how does that work together with the word culture, which has become very popular in quote unquote in our community? Uh, it's not, I'm assuming, it's not what you say. Culture is who you or who we are. It's your behaviors and actions. But what does it mean to you? Exactly. Well, culture is the, the, way, the, 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 the way in which people automatically do things and share uh, ideas and assumptions. So culture, in some ways, as people point out, is like water when you're a fish. It's just there. It's like air. Um, and the, you don't notice it until somebody transgresses or until somebody like marries in the family and says, why do you do this? Um, this is weird. Um, and, uh, you know, then all of a sudden, um, by having somebody different come in, you say, gee, that's our culture. But nobody ever mentioned it before. Um, the, the, and and, and um, in way back in, you know, built to last and, uh, um, uh, you know, people talk about how the successful companies have a strong culture in, in, in built to last as cult like cultures. And in a way, <laughs> Family businesses are definitely, and most of the successful businesses in Built to Last were, in fact, family businesses, and they had cult-like families, um, which means they had strong values, and they really wanted, expected people to live by them, and they were proud of them, and they felt that they really um, created a wonderful environment, and um, and uh, and they were. Uh, gently, um, you know, kind of uh, 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 stopping people who uh, they, they saw as, as transgressing them. I'm going to lump three words together. Uh, how important were these to these families that have been successful for 100 plus years? Discipline, habits, and routines. 
Well, discipline is, um, is something that's, that's hard and that you have to practice. Um, habits are kind of automatic. So, um, you know, sometimes you can have a habit of like listening to each other and that makes it easier. Um, routines, um, you know, are kind of like, like, like habits. They're kinds of ways of doing things. So um, in a way, a habit is a personal behavior. A routine is a kind of a group. Um, uh, you know, uh, behavior and, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, all together this, this creates uh, and, and discipline are the hard things that you, you know, you kind of don't want to do or it's hard to do, but, but you know that, that they're, they're good for you. Um, so discipline is like dieting and uh, habit is like, you know, cooking food healthy and uh, routine is we eat every day at, at five o'clock and we don't eat all day long. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, those are, you know, three things that are important in a culture. I asked this question to a lot of guests. It's my version of how Tim Ferriss often asks about a person's morning routine. I'm going to name again, a couple of words. I'm going to rank them in my order of a successful family and family office. Number one, by a mile, the people. Ideas, which are related to people, but I'm going to separate them. People, ideas, technology, and then systems or processes. To me, those are four essentials of success in an enterprise, whether a family business or a family office. Not wanting to expand it to 20, but what would you leave out, add, or what order would Dennis Jaffe choose? Well, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. I mean, it, it, you know, first impulse is to say people, because I don't think ideas, um, I don't know where ideas are if they're not connected to people. And technology is just, is simply a, a, a means. It could be good, it could be bad, it could be useful. It's like tools. Um, tools are good and technology is, is like a tool. And um, I don't know what your, your fourth, uh, what was your fourth? Uh Systems, policy and procedures, so, standards, kind of the same. Idea. Systems are, is your organization. So to me, those are all things that you find in the culture and, um, uh, and, and they're all together. I mean, I, I, I see um, the, the whole family enterprise is a system with family elements, personal relationships and caring and business elements of, uh, you know, discipline and uh, um, hard work and results and accountability. And um, uh, the, the tough thing about a family enterprise is it's a hybrid of a personal relationship system yes. and an accountable system. But when it works, it's marvelous. And these 100-year families are marvelous because they're both personal and business-oriented. And when, they, when they're working at odds with each other, they're, they could be terrible, you know, unlivable. Um, family members fighting, um, you know, business not being attended to, um, or, uh, you know, it, it, when the systems, the, the, the two kinds of systems work together, that, that's what we want in a, in a generative family enterprise. There's another uh, series of three words together that are a popular, trendy buzzword in the family office community. And I'm on board with it, but I'm gonna have a but to it. And that is gonna be the verbiage, a chief learning officer. Uh, perhaps it's something that Matt Wesley has spoken about the most, but I'll read a brief definition. The chief learning officer is a position within the family office charged with fostering the development of both the capacity and the capabilities of the family to sustain personal, cultural, and financial well-being for generations. I'm on board with it, obviously. My problem with it is for families where the, fam the bloodline passes that training on to someone else, I think they need to be more engaged, coupled with an outside set of eyes from outside the family. Oh. But to outsource that, I think that may be crazy. Well, I, 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 let, let, me, let me kind of uh, agree uh, in, 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 in another oblique way. So 
when I was in graduate school, um, my, uh, the, the, the head of our department was this wonderful guy, and he had the idea uh, and began to develop the idea of the learning organization. Um, he actually, uh, yeah, he may, might have even coined the term. And the idea is that that is a quality of a system that keeps not only doing things with discipline, but asking yourself, are these the right things to be doing, and should we be doing something different? And that's what learning, and learning is the ability to, to do something that, that really works, but then say, well, maybe we should be doing something different for some other reason and, um, and changing it. Um, now, when you talk about chief learning officer, there, there, there's a, a kind of an idea, well, this is important learning, so let's put somebody in charge of it. So before that, we had diversity officer, and um, we had um, ethics officer, and we had this and that. It's kind of like whenever you have a problem, you name an officer, and that officer goes out and makes it happen. And I think these are qualities of the culture. So to me, I, I see a chief learning officer could be a, important in, in kind of looking at different aspects. But to me, the chief learning officer is sort of the CEO. <laughs> and the same way the chief diversity officer is the CEO. These are things that are in, in, in the culture that are re reinforced. They're not, it isn't like if you name a person, then you get diversity. Or if you name a person, you get learning. Or if you name a person, um, you get chief technology officer. Then you get, uh, you know, th these, are, these are functions but they're um, but they're not um, they're not people um, and and then you know when you have all these officers you have chief technology officer chief information chief learning officer chief then you have such a giant <laughs> group of people that that uh, who's in charge of making the business work and, you know it's like uh, uh, it get, it gets a little bit um, you know I mean it, it it's just it, it's it's a great idea but it shouldn't be just embodied in one person. It's a quality. That's for sure. And Dennis, when we caught up a little bit before we started to roll, so to speak, you had your book, your latest book. Would you mind holding it up for the camera? Oh yeah, I really mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's borrowed from your grandchildren, The Evolution of 100 Year Family Enterprises by Dennis Jaffe. And, and it's amazing. Um, yeah, uh, and it's got all, it's got story, hundreds of stories of families that are doing these things, not telling you what to do, but really stories of how, how they worked out and how they didn't work out sometimes. Now, besides your book and your series of books and white papers and articles and you're prolific, you're amazing, and I know you're retired, but for those that may potentially want to learn a little more, do you still maintain a website? Yeah, DennisJaffe.com and retirement. Let me share my definition of retirement. <laughs> retirement is when you can do whatever you want and everything you do is by choice and you don't have to do anything, but you can do exactly what you think is meaningful and important and uh, you're not uh, anxious about money and finances. So I am doing work, but I'm doing work that um, matters and uh, helping families with things that are, that are important. Uh, I'm not just sitting home. I mean, everybody's sitting home, but I'm on <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> well, it's been amazing to have Dennis on for over the last hour. I could go on and on, and we want to leave some in the tank for a couple of more months when we could revisit. Uh, and maybe as Dennis is perhaps even doing research on families, relative to what's going on with COVID-19. And as this progresses around the world for longer and longer times, the stresses, resilience, and uh, stealing from the seam to lead anti-fragility that maybe some families are evolving into. But we'll save that for a bit of a different time. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, Stitcher, and other platforms. Our YouTube channel is simply Family Office. 
and I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of great success and their single family offices, uh, providing proprietary content, global programming in today's COVID world, often Monday through Friday. I used to say in the classic physical events world, I did 12 to 15 a year. Now in the digital virtual world, effectively near Monday through Friday, I do over 200 events <laughs> over the course of the year. I'm actually going through a hyper creative period, uh, doing a lot of writing, a lot of thought leadership, and a lot of even consultative services that we're rolling out, how to build that anti-fragile, quote unquote, single family office. So it's been a pretty amazing time for us. You could find me very active on social media. The website is familyofficeassociation.com. And my email is angelo at familyofficeassociation.com. Thank you, Dennis Jaffe. Thank you, everyone, today. Thank Have a great for day. creating this platform, Angelo. And You're very kind. It's been a wonderful discussion. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you, Dennis. Take care. Bye-bye.